right, so just a quick recap. Uh, back in Revelation 14, the very last chapter, we encountered again the 144,000 witnesses in heaven with the Father's name written on their foreheads, which we learned is the mark of God. And sequentially after that, we again witness the rapture of the church, just like we did in Revelation 7, except this time it was in the last chapter in Revelation 14, as we get a repetition of the timeline, followed by the wrath of God and the angels with the sharp sickles who <coughs> reap the earth and um, in a great end times harvest of souls. So that was the last chapter. And this was a picture of tribulation, which we saw in chapter 13, followed in chapter 14 by the rapture, which then was followed by the wrath of God when God's angels harvested, you know, that, that great harvest of souls, the grapes of the earth, as they were called, who were the unbelievers, and poured them into the winepress of God's wrath. And so as we're going through the second half again, you know, we continue to observe the same pattern emerge concerning the chronology of the end times that we read about in the first half of Revelation. It's the same exact pattern that we see. And now in Revelation 15, we come to a short eight verse chapter, which is a sort of interlude between the rapture, which just occurred in chapter 14 and the wrath of God being poured out via the seven last plagues. These seven last plagues that we're going to get introduced to in this chapter are the seven vials given to the seven last angels who pour out God's wrath in the form of the vials upon the earth. And so in this chapter, again, it's just a short chapter, but we'll also cover more extensively the sea of glass, like unto crystal, and the song of Moses, which those standing on the sea of glass will sing. And so here the seven angels are given the seven last plagues or the seven vials, which as we'll see in the next chapter, will occur concurrently with the trumpet judgments that began in Revelation 8. So the next chapter is when the vials will actually get poured out. And I believe that these seven last plagues or these seven last vials and both the trumpet judgments and the vial judgments will occur concurrently. Okay, and so, um, except that what we see is that the first trumpet will be blown first, followed by the first vial. Then the second trumpet is blown, followed by the second vial. The third trumpet, followed by the third vial, and so on. And that's the pattern. We'll get more detail on that in the next chapter. Again, this is just an intro to the vials uh, today, until we'll see that all of God's wrath is fulfilled and filled on the earth. And so this short eight verse chapter is merely an interlude um, that will introduce the seven angels, the seven last plagues. And in the next chapter, all the vials will be poured out. What we'll do next time in Revelation is juxtapose the vials with the trumpets to get a clear and comprehensive picture of what God's wrath will actually look like on the earth. And so with that, a uh, short intro, let's go ahead and begin. And so we're in Revelation 15, verse 1, and it says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Again, seven is a biblical number of completion, rest, and fulfillment. It's a picture of the Sabbath, the seventh day rest and resting in Christ for salvation without our works. Remember the Bible said in Genesis 2-2 that God rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And so when we're resting on the Sabbath day, when the Jews rested on the Sabbath in, in the Old Testament, they were resting from their works. They were, they were ceasing from their works. And that was a picture of grace through faith that you don't work in order to be saved. And so we also cease from our works under the tenets of the new covenant. We rest in Christ, which is the ultimate meaning of the Sabbath. That's what the Sabbath prefigured, the doctrine of grace. And so this is why as Christians, every day is a Sabbath, you know, and we're no longer bound by the Sabbath keeping laws of the Old Testament. And so what I want to admonish you is don't get caught up 
in the Hebrew roots nonsense. You're going to run into Hebrew roots kind of teaching. Now, we all love our Hebrew roots, the actual Hebrew roots in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus was a Jew. He was a fulfillment of the law. Um, you know, we, we have an affinity towards those things, and we should as believers. But what the Hebrew roots are doing are Judaizing grace and turning it into work salvation and, and demanding Sabbath keeping and law keeping, which we're no longer under the new covenant. You know, so don't get caught up in Hebrew roots or start calling Jesus Yeshua unless you're a Hebrew speaker, because Jesus's name in English is Jesus. You know, now there's nothing wrong with if you're Hebrew, it's Yeshua, you know, and, and so you want to you want to call out to Jesus in your own native tongue. But to me, I find it a little bit odd and strange when as English speakers, we start promoting the name Yeshua instead of Jesus because Jesus is actually his name. And by saying Yeshua, it's almost like saying that, you know, Jesus, the name Jesus isn't good enough. It's an attack on the name of Jesus in some ways, um, you know, but the name that I was saved by um, is Jesus. And that's the name that I was saved by. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so, you know, uh, it's perfectly fine to translate the name of Jesus you know, from the Greek or from the Hebrew into English. And so, you know, don't become a Judaizer and start Sabbath keeping. Simply rest your salvation in Christ and cease from your own works. You know, and this is important to understand because if you still feel that you have to do something in order to be saved or do something in order to stay saved, then you're not truly resting in the grace of Jesus Christ but are trying to save yourself by adding to his finished work, okay? You cannot keep the law, right? And so you don't want to be one of those to whom Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you because you never rested in Christ, but we're trying to add to the gospel of grace, which is a gift from God and not something to be earned, okay? And so there's, again, getting back to Revelation, we have the seven angels, with the seven last plagues, which it says, says fills up the wrath of God. And so God's wrath against the creation and against the world will be satisfied with the outpouring of the seven last plagues, at least his judgment here on earth, his judgment against the creation and, and the universe. You know, we'll still have, you know, his, his full wrath, the full measure of his wrath will be reserved ultimately and finally for those at the white throne judgment who rejected Jesus Christ, including all non-believers in the Antichrist and Satan himself, who will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire. And that'll fulfill God's final wrath during the final judgment. And so these seven last plagues are the ultimate expression of divine justice. Okay, they're meant to eradicate evil from the earth and to vindicate the, the righteous. And so the ultimate goal, it's a demolition. It's to wipe away the earth, wipe away all the reprobates who finally reject Christ once and for all, and they refuse to repent, and God is going to start over at the end of the world. And so whether you know it or not, we all long for the day of God's wrath, at least if you're a believer because we want justice to prevail on the earth. We want righteousness to go forth. We want wrongs righted. We want vindication of, of God's truth. And so this is why the tribulation martyrs cried out in Revelation 6.10. They said, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And so that judgment is reserved. And... Um, you know, obviously, the, the wrath has not come at that point in Revelation 6 because, the, you know, they're still crying out for, for justice, but it will come uh, in the form of the trumpets and the vials. And so how often do we see injustice happening in the here and now, uh, especially with all the insanity going on in the world? And we long and cry out for the judgment of God, you know, as we're witnessing evil and injustice increasing rapidly in the world with attacks on free speech, attacks on the family, attacks on gender, attacks on medical freedom, and attacks on children from the child grooming, child sniffing perverts in our government run schools, in our media, and in our government. 
I mean, just look at, I can't get away from mentioning this, it just happened, but just look at Joe Biden's trans day of visibility, you know, that he just declared, right? How blasphemous. I mean, people, I, I felt like it was actual blasphemy. You know, I wanted to like tear my clothes and like scream, you know, it was like so frustrating to see uh, what he did with that. Instead of focusing on Easter and the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which happened to fall on Easter this year on the, you know, March 31st, instead, he decided to proclaim Trans Visibility Day on Easter, on March 31st. And imagine if he had done that on, on Ramadan, you know, what the fallout would have been. I mean, I dare him. I dare all these trans activists and LGB activists to start targeting Muslim holidays instead of Christian holidays. Let's see what happens to them. And, you know, Biden tried to excuse it away saying he first declared March 31st Trans Visibility Day back in 2021 and that it just happened to fall on Easter this year. But I don't care. It's blasphemous. Either way, if I was president, I'm not going to celebrate anything but Easter on Easter. I'm not going to proclaim Trans Visibility Day. And he put a lot more effort into proclaiming this trans blasphemy instead of celebrating the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When it came to Easter, Biden put out a memo banning any religious symbols from the White House during the Easter celebration. Well, then what's the point? You know, Easter is a religious holiday. Easter is a Christian holiday, uh, the way we celebrate it. I don't care if, it, if the name Easter had roots in, in, you know, paganism and all this stuff. We celebrate it today as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ around, you know, Black Friday and, and, and up the Passover. And so, you know, when it comes to Easter, he blocks it all, he bans it all. You can't, it has to be just stripped away of all meaning and generic. He didn't say he is risen or mention Jesus Christ in any way, uh, but instead stripped the holy day of anything alluding to the Lord and then went and proclaimed it Trans Visibility Day. And so the LGBT cult and the trans cult, which is exactly what they are, it's become a religion, uh, can celebrate uh, you know, freely a day of abomination, but we have to strip Easter of all meaning and significance and insult half of this country and half of the world, really, who celebrate Easter um, and, and you know, offend people who take Easter to be even something more holy than Christmas, you know, in many ways. And so I actually think that this was God's way of getting back at Biden you know, and undermining his fraudulent presidency. Easter just happened to fall on March 31st in an election year. I don't think that was an accident. You know, I think that was God setting a trap and a snare to destroy Biden and get more people to hate him and alienate more people from this fake president um, so that hopefully we'll get a real president who knows how to speak, who knows how to talk, who knows how to string sentences together, that we can get a, a better president uh, in 2024. And so Deuteronomy 22.5 is the only verse that's relevant for Trans Visibility Day, which says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Okay, so our society should not cater to a special class of mentally ill, often demon-possessed perverts. We shouldn't tolerate them going into women's bathrooms with our wives and with our daughters and playing in women's sports because they're too weak and incompetent as men. And so, and I'm just taking a little time today because we're in the short chapter, um, and let's just hit on some of these points, but anyone like the LGBT allies who support drag queens or the trans cult influencing children and going into our schools and libraries are nothing but child grooming pedophiles. Okay, Romans 132 says this about L LGBTQ allies. That's the A in the LGBTQIA+, the allies, the, the supporters. It says in Romans 132, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. It's actually a death penalty offense in the Bible. 
not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Okay, and that's according to the New Testament. Okay, this is Paul the Apostle. I'm not quoting the Old, you know, why are you in the Old Testament? No, I'm in the New Testament talking about this. And the Bible is very serious about this. It's very clear about God's position. All right, Revelation 15, 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And so these are those who have come out of the tribulation. They were raptured out in the very last chapter. That was that harvest of souls that the angel reaped with this sharp sickle. And now they're pictured as standing on the sea of glass and they've overcome. They've had victory over the beast and his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. So remember now, based on the last chapter, we're talking about, as I mentioned, the saints who endured through the tribulation and were raptured out in chapter 14. And now they're pictured, they're shown as standing on the sea of glass like unto crystal. So what is the significance of the sea of glass? We first encountered the sea of glass in Revelation 4, 6. Revelation 4, 6 said, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So if you remember back in chapter 4, the sea of glass was empty. There's nobody standing on it. We're seeing a picture of it prior to the rapture, prior to to the saints being you know, called up and gathered together. But now the rapture has occurred. And as we saw in chapter 14 with the angels and their sharp sickle, and now in chapter 15, the saints who came out of tribulation are standing on the sea of glass. So now the tribulation period is over, according to the Bible at this point. This is why you know, after, it's after the tribulation, the saints are raptured, and then we get to the wrath of God and the outpouring of the trumpet judgments and the vile judgments, right? So now it's over. They're standing on the sea of glass, and the sea of glass, and God's about to pour out his wrath, but the sea of glass represents the majesty, the purity, and the holiness of God. And it shows that God is utterly holy and separate. It speaks of the fixed purity and holiness of God's divine nature. You know, in the Old Testament, when the Levites offered sacrifices to the Lord, there was this massive brazen laver, this brass laver, a big, huge container in the outer courts of the temple. And it was used by the priests to ritually wash and cleanse themselves before offering the sacrifices. And so it was for washing and for purity to cleanse the priests before the sacrifices. And so as you'll see, the brazen uh, laver was an earthly representation of the sea of glass, which is in heaven. It was picturing what, what's in heaven as the sea of glass without water. It was like a big sea. Um, Exodus 30, 18 through 20 says, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with wa water that they die not. Okay, why would they die if they didn't cleanse themselves first, because no man can approach God without cleansing, without purification. And so it's a picture of being washed by the water of the word. That's what that, that water represented. It was the cleansing of the blood in essence. And then it says, or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. And so the brazen laver was like a large sea of water. In fact, the Bible directly calls the brazen laver a sea in 1 Kings 7.23. It says, And he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits that compass it round about. So he made a molten sea. It's called a sea here. And that would have been, you know, if we look at those measurements, that would have been 15 feet in diameter and about seven and a half feet tall. And it's filled with, you could say, an ocean or a sea of water. First Kings 17.26 says, And it was in handbreadth thick, and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup with flowers of lilies 
it contained 2,000 baths. So 2,000 baths in biblical times of water would have been over 11,000 gallons of water. And so it was this big sea, molten sea made of brass, and it represented the sea of glass like unto crystal that we're now studying in the book of Revelation. So it's amazing that even in the law, in the ceremonial aspects of the law, even those things represented Christ and the end times and, and Christ's return. And so spiritually speaking, the brazen lava or molten sea of the outer court represented the washing of water by the word of God. It represents, which is ultimately the blood of Christ, which was sat, uh, shed. And so the sea of glass represents being washed and cleansed of your sins by the washing of the word of God. And that's why those in heaven who just came out of the earth, out of great tribulation, find themselves standing on the sea of glass. Ephesians 5, 26 through 27 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so it's a picture of, you know, if they're standing before the throne room of God and they're about there, you know, in the presence of the lamb, they're also, you know, being pictured as being cleansed on the sea of glass, which, which all of that goes back to those Old Testament, you know, cleansing rituals. And so the sea of glass, like unto crystal, is representative of the purity of the word of God, which has the ability to cleanse us from all sin. There's much more you could study about the sea of glass. It's a fascinating uh, element in heaven. And, um, you know, it can represent everything also from God's glory and majesty before his throne to the purity and holiness and cleansing. It's a place also of peace, calm, and safety, you know, whereas the, the world seas are often turbulent and full of waves and ever moving, the sea of glass is stationary because glass is fixed and it's not turbulent. There are no waves, but it shines like unto crystal with the everlasting light of God's glory and grace. And so, you know, standing on the sea of glass after the tribulation is a transition from the chaos and disorder of the world to the calm and steady light and glory of God's throne. And those standing on the sea of glass or the crystal sea are, st are standing in victory and they've triumphed over the beast and the antichrist system of the world. And lastly, the sea of glass represents the eternal and unchanging nature of God. You know, unlike the earthly seas that can be tumultuous and ever changing, unlike um, the, are, they're unlike the eternal and unchanging sea in God's kingdom. And so... As they're standing there, they're singing the song of Moses, which, you know, Moses, it's relevant because Moses had victory over Egypt, which is representative of victory over the world and the beast system. Revelation 15, three through four, then says, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And so they're praising God. All the nations are going to eventually end up before the throne room of God. Those, you know, a redeemed remnant from all nations will be represented. And this is a song of victory over the beast and the world system. You know, the world is done for at this point. There is no more world as we know it today. It's gonna to be demolished and destroyed. And that's what they're singing victory about. They're actually happy about this. You know, all the evil, all the wickedness, all the pride, all the sin, all the homos, all the trans, all the queers, all the abortions, all the Black Lives Matter racism all the Antifa communism, all the woke professors and news media, all the manipulation of the stock market and the economy, all the lies, misinformation, and all the propaganda. You know, all of that will be in the past and we will have victory over the beast and over the beast system. You know, all the evil that we're seeing propagated, that's actually a part of the Antichrist spirit being, you know, promoting it throughout the world. So if you follow those things, if you're an ally of the LGBT, you're an ally of the Antichrist. You need to get that through your head. 
It's not a light matter. You need to stand apart from it, stand apart from the world and say, I'm, I'm with Jesus. I'm not with the Antichrist. I'm not with Satan. I'm with Jesus. I'm with God. And so that's, you know, something that this generation of the youth especially need to understand and, and take a stand. Stop being afraid of your peers or giving in to them or just following, you know, the wind wherever it goes. And so to commemorate this victory, the saints sing the Song of Moses. And the Song of Moses appears in Exodus as well as Deuteronomy. But let's just read a portion of it starting in Exodus 15. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Exodus 15, and it says in verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So uh, the song of Moses is a song of triumph. It's a song of victory over God's enemies. So it's no wonder why the saints also who come out of tribulation specifically sing the song of Moses, because it's a song of triumphing over the world and over God's enemies. Look also at verses four through five. Pharaoh's chariot and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. So it's interesting that we, as in the church, will be singing this song of, you know, standing on the sea of glass about God's enemies being drowned in the sea. This is a reference in a way if you're looking at it spiritually, to the tumultuous sea of the world. It's that contrast between the sea of glass, which is fixed and stationary and speaks of peace and order, versus the tumultuous sea of the world that they're drowning in. And so the world is going to drown, in essence. And the end times are not only about salvation and renewal of both man and God's natural creation, but also about the final and eternal punishment of the wicked and the unbeliever. Exodus 15, 6 through 7, then says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy, and the greatness of thine excellency thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. So it's a picture of God's wrath. It's a real parallel between the Song of Moses here in Revelation 15 of what they're singing. And so in Revelation, God's wrath has just destroyed those who rose up against God and against his own people. And so just as he did with Pharaoh and his chariots. So even this episode with Moses and the children of Israel was merely a foreshadowment of enslavement of God's people by the world. You know, we're, we're living in Egypt today. You know, we're living, we're living in the world. It's a corrupt world and God's enemies are rising up against us. And so God, by his wrath um, and the greatness of his excellency, overthrows the beast and those who rise up against God. Exodus 15, 13 says, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed, Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. It's exactly what we see, the sea of glass. They're standing there in God's holy habitation. And now in the narrative, we are clearly at the point after the rapture, and God is about to pour out his wrath, his final judgment on the world, the beast, and all those who have been left behind to face God's wrath. And that's what chapter 15, that's why chapter 15 is a prelude as, you know, all we're re really getting in this chapter is an introduction or a prelude to the vile judgments to come, which are about to be poured out in chapter 16. And so the tribulation is over at this point. That's what the, you know, it's almost like that, that moment of 30 minutes of silence in heaven before God opened up the trumpet judgments and poured them out. There's an interlude between chapters because something major, something big was about to happen. This was a major event. And so, uh, you know, it was about uh, God's wrath here is about to begin. And Moses' song ends in verse 19, Exodus 15, 19. You can go back and read the whole thing. But it says, For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. 
So that's kind of a parallel. They're, you know, they're standing on the sea in heaven. They're standing on dry ground, even though it's a sea, it's a sea of glass. And so real parallels here, which is why they're literally singing the song of Moses. And whereas the world below is about to be destroyed with fire, not with water um, this time, but it's representative of that drowning. And whereas Pharaoh and his horsemen were drowned in the sea below, God's people are standing on the sea above, walking on the sea, standing on the sea, and triumphing over the wicked on the sea. And like the children of Israel, standing on the midst of the sea, untouched by the wrath of God. And so it's, it's almost like the parting of the Red Sea there. Revelation 15, 5 through 6, then says, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And so the seven last angels come out of the temple, and verse 5 mentions the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven. What is that? Right? The tabernacle of the testimony in heaven. This is a reference to the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. You know, that's the testimony in heaven that was in the tabernacle. Remember, that was kept inside of the Ark of the Covenant with Aaron's rod that budded, the Ten Commandments, the jar of manna, it was all there. And like I mentioned earlier, I don't believe the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant is anywhere here on earth. Okay, I believe that it's been taken up to heaven or its earthly form was destroyed and only the heavenly version exists. But I just don't, and I know some of you, you know, are fans of, of Ron Wyatt and, you know, but I just don't believe people like Ron Wyatt who claim that they found the ark but can't provide any evidence. You know, the evidence somehow mysteriously disappeared or became inaccessible only after he saw it. So I just I just don't buy that. Uh, and Revelation 15, 4 makes it clear that it's the ark of the testimony is there in heaven. So if it's in heaven, it's not on earth. Remember also back in Revelation eleven nineteen it said, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. There's the Ark of the Covenant. There it is, right? It's the, that the Testament was the, the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments. And so both Revelation 11 and Revelation 15 talk about those things being in heaven. And so, you know, if somebody claims they found it here on earth, I want to see evidence of that, you know? Um, and so we're just, we just don't see that. And so the seven last angels come out having the seven last plagues the vials that will cover in detail in the next chapter. And it says in verse six, uh, Revelation 15, six, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. So it says that the angels were clothed in pure and white linen and they had their breasts girded with golden girdles. So we've seen this before on the Son of Man, this, this golden girdle on Jesus, the pure and white linen uh, that the angels are now wearing with that golden girdle. And so that pure and white linen represents purity, holiness, and righteousness. And so this signifies that the angels are fit to pour out God's wrath and are his divinely appointed or, and ordained instruments of justice. That's why they're wearing the same garb as Jesus there. He's given them his authority to pour out his wrath as these you know, holy ministers of God. And so the saints also, it says, will be wearing pure and white linen. We see that in Revelation 19, 8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Of course, we obtain our righteousness by the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ as he transfers his righteousness to us through faith when we believe in his atoning blood, sacrifice, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So that's the only way to be made pure is by the efficacy of a sacrifice received by grace through faith alone. So it's a constant struggle, something we're all you know, having to constantly preach 
is to try to convince people that they can't earn their own way to heaven. You know, you can't be a co-savior with Christ. It's Christ alone. You're, he doesn't need your help to save you. Okay, um, and so it's either Jesus Christ and Him crucified, or it's nothing at all. Right? The cross. A good friend of mine used to say this: the cross plus anything equals nothing. Okay, so you have the cross plus anything equals nothing it makes the cross of none effect if you're not trusting in it by grace through faith alone if you're trying to add to it and so add anything to the pure atoning sacrifice of jesus christ on the cross and it's no longer grace because the whole point was grace the whole point was that we couldn't keep the law the whole point is that we're all sinners and we can't you know measure up to the standard of god so how are you trying to measure up still when you can't right and so Paul said in Romans eleven six, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. That's a pretty, you know, simple, straightforward, logical statement. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. That's pretty clear. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. He's saying it's grace or works. Take your pick. You can't have both. You're either going to have to trust in Jesus completely, or you're going to have to try to save yourself through your own works. There's just no in between. Can't have it both ways. It's not like it's by grace, but I'm going to help out, or I'm going to, you know, keep doing good just in case, you know, it's it's a little bit of works involved. You know, no, keep doing good. You should keep doing good, but not for salvation, for discipleship. You know, I've said it many times, salvation happens in an instant of belief. The moment that you truly put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're born again, you've been made perfect in the spirit, you've received the imputation of Christ by his blood, and you're saved. But discipleship is a lifelong process. It's a lifelong, you know, uh, process of works and self-sacrifice and doing good and doing things uh, to be a disciple not not for salvation you know salvation is a free gift ephesians 2 8 says it is the gift of god romans 5 15 says but not as the offense so also is the free gift romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord and in john 4 10 jesus said to the samaritan woman at the well if thou knewest the gift of god and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. Finally, 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Look how many times the Bible says it's just a gift, right? Salvation is the gift of God. It's a free gift. And if it's a gift, it can't be earned. If you have to, you know, give it back because you did something wrong, then it was never a gift to begin with, right? And so... You know, it's kind of like an example. Hey, Tim, can I use you as a quick prop real quick? Uh, sure. Okay, so I want to come up for a sec. Um, so I want to give you this gift, this uh, King James Version Bible. But I need you to come over and chop some wood later. Is that... that sounds like a great deal. Right, it's, it's not a gift then, a... right? Right. Can I take it back from you? Um, not if, if it's a gift. Not if it's a gift, right? So that's yours right there. Okay, thank you. Enjoy, right? So that's, that's kind of the point. You can really have it. Oh, okay. It's a gift. <laughs> there you go. If I take back that gift, it's no longer a gift. And that's, that's salvation, right? You can't ask. God's not asking you to do anything for it. It's simply the free gift of God. And so, you know, Paul said to the Galatians who had fallen from grace... Uh, to practicing works for salvation. He said in Galatians 3, 1 through 3, O foolish Galatians who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Right? So you cannot perfect your flesh. Your flesh is dead. It has to die. 
And so all the works we're trying to do for salvation is just fleshly works, you know. Uh, the, the, the body has to be born again. The body has to be resurrected to give up the sin nature that resides inside of the flesh. It's the only way. And so by, you know, what else did Paul say, actually? He said in Romans 10, 3, 4, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, right? So if you believe, Christ is the end of the law. There is no more law keeping. Uh, we're under a new covenant. And so trying to add works to the gospel for salvation, whether before or after salvation, means that you're not trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that you haven't submitted yourselves unto the righteousness of God. And so what does the Bible say about our own righteousness? Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, right? So what are our works? Are just filthy rags. Look at this last thing on this. It's a really cool picture in Zechariah 3, 3 through 4. This is, look what God said to Joshua the high priest. It says, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. That's his works that we just read about in Isaiah 6, 4. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And so Christ takes your filthy rags, he takes your works, your dead works, and he replaces them with his righteousness. That's the pure and white linen. You know, salvation requires a change of clothes. Christ takes our filthy rags, which represent our own works and our own sins, and by his substitution, he replaces them with new, clean, white garments, representing that we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. What about the golden girdle that they're wearing? The angels are also wearing a golden girdle or sash in, in modern terms around their chest, right? The golden girdle represents royalty and divine authority. You know, Christ wore a golden girdle, Revelation 1.13, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And so the golden girdle connects the angels to Christ, right? It's his divine and royal authority and power that he's given to them to execute his justice and judgment upon the earth. And this is exactly what the angels will do in the next chapter. But Revelation 15, seven through eight ends this chapter. And it says, one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels, seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And so why is there smoke from the glory of God? Uh, smoke from God in the Bible represents the presence of God. This is because God's presence is often accompanied by fire and the smoke of his judgment. We see this in Exodus 19.8 on Mount Sinai, the giving of the law. It says in Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole Mount quaked greatly. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole Mount quaked greatly. And so God also led the Israelites in the wilderness with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so here, the smoke represents the unapproachable holiness of God in his temple as the smoke fills his temple in heaven and no one is able to enter in or approach him, change what's about to come. And so in the next chapter, that, that ends today's sermon, but in the next chapter is where it really begins with the vials. Um, gets really you know, exciting there. We're going to look at all the trumpet judgments and compare them to the vile judgments, and we'll, we'll get a, a very clear picture 
of what the wrath of God will look like next time.